There are, I think, about 150 people in this room. So just imagine what it would feel like to step out onto the stage in front of 10 times as many people. That was the challenge that faced Keith Jarrett back in 1975. He was going to improvise a concert of solo piano music at the Cologne Opera House. No sheet music, no rehearsal, just one man and one piano. But a few hours before that concert, a young German teenager called Vera Brandis, just 17 years old, stepped with Jarrett out onto the stage of the empty opera house, looked out, and she was thrilled because it was Vera's idea to get Keith to come to Cologne. She was fueled only by her enthusiasm for jazz. And despite the fact she didn't really know what she was doing, she began to set up these concerts. And the Jarrett concert was just the fourth one that Vera had organized. So Vera introduced Keith to the piano. And Jarrett looked at the piano, somewhat suspiciously, walked around it, went to talk to his producer. His producer came over, played a couple of notes. Vera, by this time, of course, is feeling really concerned. And then Keith Jarrett's producer, Manfred Eicher, comes over to Vera and says, if you don't get a new piano, Keith won't play. Now, this wasn't some kind of fussy, prima donna-ish behavior from Keith Jarrett. There was a real problem with this instrument. What had happened was the movers from the opera house had found a piano, it turned out to be the wrong one, moved it onto the stage, and it's half past three on a Friday afternoon, everyone knocks off for the weekend. That's it. There's no, there's no way of replacing this thing. So what did they leave Keith Jarrett? They left him a beaten up old rehearsal model. So the white keys were, were sticking, the, the black keys were out of tune, the pedals didn't work, the upper register of the piano was harsh and tinny because the felt had worn away. And the most important thing is that it wasn't a grand piano. It wasn't, a, there wasn't a, Vera Randa said it was like, it was a tiny piano, it was like half a piano. It wasn't loud enough to reach the back of this epic space. It was unplayable. So of course Keith said he wouldn't play it. So Vera got on the phone, tried to arrange a replacement, got a piano tuner in, you know, at least we can get it in tune. But it very quickly became apparent there would be no replacement. There was no way to get a proper piano onto the stage. And so all she could do was to, to go out, find Keith Jarrett, who was sitting outside the opera house, in the rain, in his car, and through the window of his car, beg him to play. I'm 17 years old, 1,400 people are showing up in five hours. Please play. And so he looked at this rain-drenched teenager, felt sorry for her, and said, never forget, only for you. And so, a few hours later, Keith Jarrett stepped out again onto the Clone Opera House stage, a packed auditorium, 1,400 people. He sat down at the unplayable piano, and he began. it became clear that something magical was happening. So Jarrett had decided he was going to avoid these tinny upper registers of the piano. He, he, was, he was going to stick to the middle tones, which gave the work this very soothing, ambient quality. And that might have made it sound a little bit, uh, little bit wallpapery, a little bit too peaceful, a little bit boring. But of course, the other problem that Jarrett had was that the piano was too quiet. So, one of his solutions was to set up these rolling, repetitive riffs in the bass to, to try to generate enough resonance to reach the back of the concert hall. And the other thing he did was simply to stand up and to, to twist and to pound down on the piano. You can hear him moaning into the instrument, complaining about it as he plays. But that gives the work this amazing energy. So there's this restfulness and there's this dynamism and the combination of the two is electrifying. And the audience loved it. And audiences continue to love it. I mean, my, two of my children were born to this music. And, and I know they're, they're not the only ones, because this is the most successful 
solo jazz album in history and the most popular piano album in history. It's a masterpiece. But Keith Jarrett didn't want to play. I mean, yes, he was handed this mess, he embraced it, and he soared, but he had to be guilt-tripped into it. He did not think to himself, hmm, crap piano, this is the perfect opportunity <laughs> to really extend myself creatively. He said, this is a bad instrument, it's gonna be a bad concert. You might be wondering, why was it recorded at all? It turned out that Jarrett and Eicher, his producer, they wanted to record this concert. They decided at the last minute they were going to record it because they wanted a documentary record of what a musical catastrophe sounds like. <laughs> so they could play it to future promoters and say, if you don't give us the right piano, this is what you will hear. They never thought it was going to be good. But it was good. It was breathtaking. So that's what I want to talk about. The way that when we're handed these difficult situations, we have to work with tools that break in our hands, or people who annoy us, or, or we have to cope with distractions, all sorts of messy, challenging problems. We actually become better versions of ourselves. These things help us solve problems. They help us be more creative. And yet, like Keith Jarrett, very naturally, we will tend to try to resist. We will reject them.